Welcome, everybody. Um, today we got chainsaw safety uh, for lunchtime, I guess, <laughs> or before lunch or after lunch for some of you all. Uh, first off, thanks, Nicole and UK for hosting this for you all. Um, thank you, attendees, for showing up today. I mean, it's chainsaws are something we use in the industry, whether you're using it at home, at work, but the, what we're going to cover today does not cover the full aspect of all the chainsaw. So just keep that in mind. If you like the full version, reach out to Nicole T2 program and we'll schedule you all some training in-house or whatever so we can get you the full course. Um, so we're going to get some information and understanding. Most of you all, hopefully everyone's used a chainsaw at some point in their career at work or at home. But we're going to cover some basic stuff that you're probably familiar with that knock the dust off you. So I'm going to open up a PowerPoint here. And we'll get rocking and rolling. So, like Nicole said, my name is Chris Scamblehorn. I've been with Louisville Metro a little over 13 years. We have, I'm the safety and equipment training manager. We have 93 courses now for public works. We, I got a wonderful team that works for me, but we're always looking at a way how we can improve the skills and mindset of our operators, as, but most importantly, safety. So, always take that into consideration. So, always trying to help folks make better decisions where they don't hurt themselves. Um, you ask yourself why this topic, I mean, there's too many people that get injured and killed with chainsaws every year. So, I mean, it's very important that we try to reduce the risk and the number of those that actually occur. Um, obviously there's various types of chainsaws anymore. You got your standard chainsaw, then you got Arbor style compound, um, pole saws. Now we got electric pole saws, electric chainsaws, a uh, battery operated one. So, the industry is always changing. You got various sizes, motors, size of bars, chain diameter. So where do we use them at? Like I said, you got commercial, residential use. We have people that use them out of bucket trucks, climb trees still. But for us public works folks, there's a lot of ground operations. 90% of the time we're working on trees. That are, they're down on the ground after a storm, right? So, but there are times we have to do right away cutbacks and various operations in our industry. So we're going to talk about the importance of it today. Basically, it's injury prevention, reduce the risk of you trying to get hurt or someone else getting hurt, workers' comp, uh, workforce development, and obviously it's an OSHA requirement. Some of those uh, OSHA standards that do apply for it are here on the screen. This, this ain't every OSHA standard, obviously, that may apply to your Pacific industry, but obviously you got to do some training. Um, Y'all probably heard of the OSHA part of it, but ANSI is the... ANSI Z133 is the one that actually applies to Arborist when it comes to chainsaws. And ANSI stands for American National Standards Institute. You're supposed to re receive training every initially, then every three years. And then a couple other criteria OSHA requires involved in an accident, injury, and so forth. So keep that in mind. This ain't every one of them, but you just need to be mindful. You might want to review if you need to. Internet's a great source. Here are the topics in the outline of today, some of the things we're going to discuss in the webinar. Like I said, once again, this isn't everything that you need to know with a chainsaw being in OSHA's eyes deemed to be qualified. And they got a very lengthy definition, having numerous years of experience. They don't deem you qualified, unfortunately. So keep all that in mind. But we're going to cover all the statistics, liability, personal protective equipment, uh, the components of a chainsaw. Um, some basic maintenance procedures, and then general safety precautions. So, unfortunately, in 2012, there were 243 fatalities while engaged in tree trimming and clearing activities. So, it's one too, too many. But if, you, if you're looking at it here, it's got a couple of different areas, the criteria that people have actually lost their life in. It's struck by a felling tree. Um, actually cut by uh, got caught up in a wood chipper. Unfortunately, that still happens. Um, and that falls under the chainsaw um, statistics. Falls from trees, lifts, ladders, and electrocution. I mean, 
when trees come down, a lot of times after a storm, there's electrical lines that they get tangled up in. And we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. So, um, so I'm going to have Nicole pop up a poll question for you. Um, answer to your okay. best ability. Let's see here. So it's talks about injuries. 80% of the injuries affect the left, uh, the legs and the left wrist and hand. So yeah. why do y'all think that is? And she's going to pop that up here. Do you see it? Good job, everybody. Now, basically, you know, kickbacks happen all the time with chainsaws, and they, they're going to happen to you when you least expect it, right? And you may naturally throw your left hand up there because they don't make a left-handed chainsaw, unfortunately. So you, your right hand's on the pistol grip and your hand's throwing up, or we have folks not wearing chainsaw chaps. But when it comes to uh, a chainsaw injury, usually they're some of them are minor, but vast majority of them, if any of you all have ever had stitches before, we I could say – 110 stitches is quite a bit of stitches, and that's your average count. Some people I've heard two, three, four hundred stitches because it's, it's unfortunately a chainsaw. It can be like a meat grinder. It's just going to rip through your flesh, to be honest with you. And some injuries are more severe than others. Some are very minor, but keep that in mind. So why do most injuries occur? I mean, one-handed use, guilty, over-aggressively cutting. When you get there to the end, you're like, oh, I'm going to make going to finish these cuts. I know I'm tired, but I'm going to keep on going and push through it. Got a dull chain. Uh, lack of knowledge and experience. I've, we all had to start somewhere, right? And then fatigue. Chainsaws are workhorses, right? So here's a diagram here. Take a, take a moment. Take a look at this. I mean, this is in 2010. There was almost 31,000 injuries that are actually recorded and documented. Just keep in mind, there's goal, there's a whole lot that are out there that go unrecorded and documented. So, so take a notice of your high, your areas here. You got the head area, it's got some impact, the shoulders, the chest. Look at the left and right hands. Look at the difference on them. You know, obviously impact of the legs, from all from the waist all the way down, all to the all to the feet. That still happens. I mean, boots on or not, it could still cut through it. So depends on how sharp the chain is, um, if, when it kicks back, what angle it hits you at. So just be mindful of all that. This is some stuff. And, one, and when I'll show you a stance here in a little bit, some stuff that you may want to practice and incorporate and trying to prevent you all from getting hurt, especially with the feet and stuff too. So talk about who pays for injuries. Well, unfortunately, the person that's probably going to pay the most is the person that got injured, unfortunately. So the pain, the suffering, lost time, downtime, recovery. Um, some people get embarrassed, but we all work for government for most of us or whatever. If you're, or if you're at home, I mean, taxpayers, we pay for injuries, workers comp. Um, if you work for a government municipality, uh, OSHA penalties, fines sometimes can come with that. Maintenance, loss of productivity, because if you get hurt at work, someone else has got to pick your slack up, right? And I'd rather be at work than have a chainsaw injury. I think all you all probably can attest to that too, but your coworkers may be down on it too and wish they were there, but also your family. I mean, you think if some bills and stuff don't stop coming in, daily activities, if you're up you're up in the bed out for a little while, I mean, chores, somebody's going to take care of you a little bit. So keep, keep mindful. You don't want to have to involved in an injury. That's the main thing. So when it comes to personal protective equipment, this is just a layer of protection. You know, it's not a cure-all, but if you practice administrative controls prior to this is your third line of defense here. So basically, you got to make sure you have the proper PPE, you inspect it before each use, and you wear it right. Just don't say, oh, it takes longer to put it on to make this cut. Next thing you know, you got a, you got a pretty severe injury. So inspect it, put it on properly. Uh, your hard hat, a forestry style hard hat they show here is basically, it's optional. It's not required, but you need to wear a hard hat, face shield. Just like I said, if you have it, put it down. It's just another layer of protection between you and your face if it does kick back at you. So the safety glasses here, I, yeah, they actually come out with some better safety glasses because I know from chainsaw and experience, we've all actually – fog up our glasses, right? We get hot, sweaty, the body heat's coming up. They actually make a true anti-fog safety glasses now. The actual anti-fog is baked into the lens. So it will never fog up. Yeah, you'll still sweat on them, but you won't wipe the fog off. So 
but make sure there's Z87 approved either on the side or on the front lens there and be, be mindful what you purchase and stuff. Try to buy from a reputable dealer. Uh, hearing protection, there's numerous types out there anymore. Um, per, personal preference, earmuffs that are on the hot Porsche hat do get you a lot hotter during the summer. Winter months, they're, they're a lot more ideal for that, but make sure you put some earmuffs or earplugs in, whether they're disposable or reusable. Um, some gloves. Gloves actually aren't required, but if you do wear gloves, try to avoid using jersey gloves. They're just like a sock, you know, and it's not going to give you any, a firm grip. So actually, I recommend that you find like a leather type glove with some padding in the palm for ergonomics because it's it's some... It's a machine that's going to vibrate and it's going to wear you out a little bit more. Um, some more um, PPE that's required is actually a pair of chainsaw chaps when you're doing ground operations. Uh, they make these in different lengths, um, different layers. The standard layer is a six layer. They do make up to a nine layer chaps and they actually stick like a sleeping bag though. So. It's going to get you a lot hotter in the summer months, but six layers sufficient. It's got a, a product called Intec in there. It's layers of padding. It's basically a cut retardant. Yes, you can still get cut with a pair of chainsaw chaps on. So um, if you had, they even made waist extenders. So if you need, you got a bigger round waist, you can actually get uh, 12 inch extenders so they can fit you properly. And usually when you get a new pair or even an old pair, they get, they get pretty nasty and dirty, right? So you may have to wash them, but I'm going to recommend if you wash them, you just wash them with mild soapy detergent. Don't put no heat to them and don't throw them in the dryer because you can actually mess the uh, intact padding up on the inside of them. Uh, footing, uh, you need some good foot protection. A leather type boot with a hard sole, um, steel or composite. Uh, try to avoid using any nylon or polyester type of boot because it's just going to shred right through those. A good chainsaw will. Um, when it comes to clothing, uh, a lot of your all shops and folks may actually have the option to have a good class two or class three shirt, but some of y'all may wear vests or jackets. Uh, make sure if you do have those on, they're zipped up or take them off or tuck them in because the chainsaw is a rotating chain. So ultimately, it's a, it can grab you and it's going to pull it into you. So if you have to you have the opportunity to take it off, but if you have to wear it, tuck, make sure it's properly snug, nothing, everything zipped up and tucked away properly. So we're going to watch a, a little video clip here, here in a minute. But as you see in this picture here, this gentleman's actually got a, actually an in-tech jacket on. They, it's not required. They do, they do provide that or whatever for some industries, some logging industries and stuff wear them. Um, the video that's going to come up, I'm going to narrate through it and just talk through it. There's no sound or anything to it. But um, I'm also going to go right into the chainsaw chaps portion of it. And if you look at this picture here, this is what Intech looks like when it's ripped out of a pair of chainsaw chaps. And we're going to, in the video, I'll show you a demonstration here, but it pulls all those fibers out. It's going to clog up the side sprocket as well as the front sprocket as well. So like I said, now be mindful of this. If any of you all, uh, they're coming into our industry, the electric and battery powered chainsaws, they're not going to hold up like a gas powered chainsaw because they have trouble because it's continuous rotation of the side sprocket there. They have trouble clogging it up. They will slow them down and eventually stop them, but not like a, a gas powered one. So be mindful of that. And sometimes you'll get a pair of chaps down there, but have a tag on there and say not effective with electric or battery powered. So we'll take a quick look at that or whatever, and we'll watch this video real quick. So this is the first video portion of the video is about PP. Like I said, check your hard hat out. Uh, they're good for five years. Make sure your shell and suspension is all intact. Safety glasses. Like I said, they have so millions of different styles out there anymore. But make sure there's Z87 approved on the side or on the front lens. Hearing protection. Like I said, other options besides the muffs here. And these are the Christmas tree kind. That's the kind I prefer. They're reusable, but they probably provide you guys a lot with those foam insert ones, disposables, gloves. Try to avoid the uh, jersey gloves. Get you something that's got a good cuff on it. But that's an open cuff glove there. So if you're feeding a wood chipper, you can't use that glove, actually. Chainsaw chaps. 
I do a good inspection of all that. Uh, at least the six layer. May, if there's any nicks or damage to them, you're not supposed to use them. Got to take them out of service. Keep them clean. Keep your buckles all intact. Make sure they're all there. I've read stories of people had them on, but the, the waistband buckle was missing. And guess what? They still got hit with a pair of chainsaws because they're flopped over. He had them on, but not on properly. <laughs> it happens. Get you some, make sure you got you some good boots, some with ankle support. I mean, most of the time trees are down or off in a ditch or off the roadway somewhere, some hard sole, some slip resistant leather style. This is full gear. Obviously, the, the face shield is optional, it's not required. And if you have a face shield, you still have to wear a pair of the safety glasses. It's required regardless. Gloves are optional. And the chainsaw chaps are required when you're doing ground operations. And it goes all to the top bar of the boot there. And here's the uh, chainsaw chaps and importance of why you're wearing them. Now, this chainsaw is a friend of mine, BJ. This chainsaw is really heavy, really sharp, and it's running a full throttle RPMs when he hits it and he drops it kind of hard. So watch. Stops it immediately, and put a little nick in the wood, but there's going to be a lot of variables that, that come into play when you actually hit hit the hit the leg or whatever if you do. And it's going to pull the chainsaw into you more. It's going to actually grab and pull into you. So we'll go back to the PowerPoint here. This So when it pulled it into it, I mean, it's there's going to be a lot of variables, old chaps versus new chaps, um, the weight of the saw, the, the angle of the impact, uh, how sharp it is. And there's and just those variables can depend on how severe you still got. They'll still cut through sometimes the chaps and a pair of jeans and you still may get hit. But the severity of the injury is going to be drastically reduced. So you're going to be way better off. Um, you may have noticed in the video, uh, BJ was not wearing, he was wearing a, a climber. He climbs trees, actually. The face shields aren't required and gloves aren't required, once again, for the standard. So a lot of a lot of guys have been doing it for a long time. Don't worry, because it's more gear they got to keep up with, unfortunately. But uh, they climb trees, and that's, if you ever seen me climb trees and trim trees, that's hard work. <laughs> so my hat's off to them. So... We're gonna look at the components of a chainsaw. So this is your basic setup of a chainsaw here. I mean, you got your back handle, which they, some people refer to as a pistol grip. It's got a, a guard for your knuckles from the, the chain ever broke. Um, so safety switch on the back with the throttle. And you come to the side, you got your uh, intake housing right there on the side and your caps, your fuel cap, as well as your oil cap for your bar oil in the front there. Come up to the front side there, you got your muffler and uh, bark rester and all that, and your bar and chain. Um, some of those caps, some people don't like those caps that style because they, they have trouble with me mouth. When you put your caps on, they don't strip out or sometimes they get broke. So a lot of people don't like that. You got your um, front hand guard in the front. Uh, that's where your chain break is and how you apply it. And I'll show you a demonstration on a video here shortly on actually how to properly set your chain break. And then you got your front handle. I've seen the front handles get broke and stuff before where people throw them in the back of the bed of a truck. They're not properly secured and stuff. So uh, also steel has a, a new feature that came out with a few years ago. It's I haven't seen it on any other ones, uh, Husqvarna or anything, but it actually it's got it's like an inertia. It's a quick stop. So if it does kick back at you, it's designed to stop engage the chain brake within two tenths of a second. Now, saying that the chain, the bar can still come back at you and hit you. Hopefully, the chain's not rotating still. So, that's some technology they're coming along the ways and all that. So, some other components. Uh, these are some additional features also that you may see on a chainsaw, but versus makes, models, manufacturers. Uh, you're gonna have a standard start, stop switch, a choke, half choke, and full choke. Uh, some of them, um, models you'll see a primer bow for fuel. And then the decompression button you may have, they call it the pawpaw button, which I think it makes it a lot easier to start in it. So um, when it comes to the bar, 
having the correct size chain on the right bar and it's all stamped on the side bar or whatever. So make sure you get the right one on there, the proper length. Can you put a chain on backwards? Yeah. <laughs> Seen it happen numerous times. Brand new chain, one of the ones not cutting. Well, you got it on backwards. It ain't biting. So it actually happens. And then um, adjusting the chain. Um, uh, follow the operator's guide in it or whatever. And uh, I got a good question coming up here. I'm going to see how truthful you are on me on this one here. Uh, poll questions coming up here. Have you ever used a chainsaw with a dull chain? Let's be honest. <laughs> you know, if you ever worked worked hard, you know you use one with a dull chain. So we're back on it. Um, thank you all. Um, so when you're doing chainsaw maintenance, obviously for you take a chainsaw out and take it out of the box or whatever, when you go out and take it out of the field or take it out of your truck and take a look at it, make sure it ain't got no missing parts, nothing broken or anything on it. Uh, do a good visual inspection on it because saws do break. Uh, unfortunately, the newer saws now seem like they're a lot cheaper made than the older saws that I've, I've seen out there over the years, a lot more plastic on them and uh, carburetors and everything. So take be mindful when you're uh, doing your mix, make sure you do your proper mix. A lot of shops have switched over to that true fuel, which is like a higher octane, 92, 93 octane. It's already pre-mixed, but if you do mix it, make sure you do something. Uh, try to use an 89 octane if you mix it yourself. If you look in the operator's manual on it, it's going to recommend that you use something with a higher octane So, because it's going to run at so many RPMs. Um, motor oil. Who's used motor oil for bar oil before? <laughs> well, actually, that's some people. Actually, bar oil is usually a 30-weight oil, but try to stick with the manual. Man uh, specs on that just for the simple case they have actual additives in there obviously bar oil is a little bit thicker like honey um it's designed it's formulated specifically for chainsaw so but some people still rely on good old 30 weight oil so they try to avoid doing it because you'll prolong the life of your equipment and cleaning your equipment i mean you gotta take care of your equipment right i mean it's some chainsaws are two three four five two thousand dollars now for some chainsaw so Take uh, take good care of it. Check it all out. Make sure all your safety features work on it. Chain brake, front handle, your trigger guard, and all that. And if a chain brake does not work on a chainsaw, you do not use it. So and the proper way to actually check a chainsaw chain brake is when you get it fired up and warmed up, give it a little bit of throttle, get some little bit of momentum rotation on the chain, and then roll your wrist to make sure that chain comes to a complete stop. Uh, if it does not, take it out of service and get it uh, fixed. Lock, uh, tag it out and take it to the repair shop or work on it in house. Whatever you got to do. So, but if you do clean your chainsaws, blowing some of uh, the dust and the dirt off the side compartment, and use an air compressor or something. Now, don't use any more than thirty psi. You don't blow particles all around the place and get in your eyes and everything. Um, we're gonna go back to the video. Um, if you look on the screen here, this is called a two-in-one file. This is something that uh, came out to the industry a couple years ago. It's actually three files in the system, and it's a two, it's a two round and a flat. It actually, gets the top part of the drag and everything. So he actually sharpens the whole actual the proper angle and everything. Kind of, you see, it's got grooves on it, and there's actual arrows that are actually on this, and actually kind of dumbs it down for us. You know where we can't mess our chains up because chains are what twenty, fifteen, thirty dollars a piece anymore. So you want to take care of your chains, uh, especially if the, you buy them yourself. Um, but make sure you have some gloves on and uh, some safety glasses and stuff when you're actually going and sharpening. it. But I'm going to show you a video of it. I mean, they're, these things are about $30 a piece. Files do go bad, so you could pop the end cap off and actually replace files if you need them. This is a great tool if you're out in the field. Actually, some gloves on. You're not always going to have, I'd say, to practice without a bench vise because when you're out in the field, you're probably not going to have that luxury unless you got one mounted on the uh, tailgate of your truck or something. But make sure you got your tool. Make sure it's all adjusted properly, got it all cleaned out. And like I said, if you buy one of these, make sure you purchase the one that's got this one's a 3 8 pitch. So make sure you buy one because you got to make sure the files are compatible with the chain. And it's stamped on the side of the bar there. 
It's got an angle. It's got a little arrow. And when you make, when you actually sharpen this, make full strokes with it or whatever, all the way through. And like, obviously this chain on here is brand new. I'm not going to run into any resistance, right? But first couple of swipes, probably the first three or four swipes, you're going to run into some resistance. And that's, that means this chain's dull or it's folded over a little bit, but all the way through. There's also some good videos out there on YouTube on how to do this as well. But if you practice this when you're out in the field, every time I shut, shut the chains off to refuel it and get more bar oil in it, I let it cool down. And before I go again, I break out the two-in-one file and I go on and sharpen. So I never operate with a dull chain anymore. And I'm not going to get worked out. <laughs> Pause this here. I'll come back to this. Great little tool. But just make sure you go proper angles and you don't actually tear your chain up in the process or whatever. Make sure, like I said, you have the proper ones for that after saw and chain. Some uh, other stuff. I think one thing we all can agree on is chainsaws. They're going to work you out. This will work out. It says, come on, get you some, right? We're going to have some fun today. So obviously you got, you got limitations just like the saw does. So you need to take breaks. If you're out there with, you should have at least two people, you and one other person in case something happens. Rotate, take breaks, um, take turns using it. But obviously, I mean, you're going to, you're going to get worn out and that's when you start making unsafe decisions. And that's when stuff actually have actually occurs when people get hurt on the, hurt on the job or hurt at home. Um, use the right saw for the job equipment. A lot of people anymore. I love post saws. I love the arbor style, the compound style, but some people are trying to cut some big old logs and stuff with those saws. Yeah. Can they do it? Yeah, they can. Just be mindful. It's got its limitations. It's kind of like, give you an example. Say you're trying to pull a big old boat with a four cylinder truck. Yeah. You're going to tear that truck up, right? It can do it, but it's struggling. So just be mindful, use the right saw for the right job. Um, bystanders, you're going to have people around when you're out there, when you're doing tree work. Some people may be running a wood chipper, chainsaw and post saw. You need to try to eliminate those hazards, reduce the risk of someone getting hurt. I mean, you can set up a perimeter with some cones, uh, but ideally, if you, can, if you can't eliminate the hazard, you got to reduce the risk. You got to make sure everybody knows what's going on. Um, Safety manuals are a great source of information. I mean, anytime you get a new piece of equipment, they, they provide you with an operator's manual. Uh, get in there, take a look at it. Some model specific, maybe something different that you may not be familiar with, some different features it may provide. So, and then, like I said, summer work versus winter work. It's, it's all going to be a little bit different. So, dress for the weather, stretch, be mentally prepared and physically prepared. Um, more precautions you need to take care of job briefings. When you fall under the ANSI Z133 standard, it's required that you do a job briefing. So when you're doing that job briefing, it's you need to plan at the shop, make sure everybody's got all their personal protective equipment. We know where we're going. And then when you get to the job site, you do another one. And then you need to do it frequently throughout the job. So everybody's on the same exact page. Everybody knows what everybody's doing because Unfortunately, there's no two trees alike out there, whether they're standing or on the ground. So you 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 can plan how you did this tree, but the next job you go to is going to be maybe totally different. So plan for it, step back, think about it, plan, and then let everybody's on the same page. Um, when you're felling trees, I mean, obviously, you really should be a certified arborist or someone that really knows all their types of trees and everything. I mean, we've all dropped trees before, but if you don't know what you're doing, you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. So just keep that in mind. Um, having a planned escape route. How many of you have tripped over your own gear before? Tree branches and stuff. You get trimming the trees and look around. You know, you got a big pile and you got a, a chainsaw that's running without the chain break on and almost slip and fall over own, your own branches you just trimmed off or your own equipment. So it, it it's happens. I've seen it happen quite a bit. That's when a lot of injuries actually do occur. Um. Environmental hazards. Oh, this is a big one. Whew. Well, we're in their habitat, right? <laughs> well, trees, got snakes, insects, name an animal. We've had raccoons coming out of trees, snakes come out of trees. But 
one thing that a lot of people are, get dermatitis, poisonous plants, poison ivy, poison sumac, and all that. So that's all out there. So we can we can't stop all that stuff. It's inevitable when it comes to trees. Um, trees by power lines. Yeah, when you're up, if you're ever up in a bucket truck, power lines do sway back and forth. Um, they the, the rule of thumb is ten foot away from power lines. In order to work within that ten foot a power line. You actually got to be what they call a certified line clearance arborist and uh, utility companies. Your big ones are going to actually provide that training for you. It's, it's a couple of days training, but they got their own contractors on payroll that actually trim trees around power lines. So and they call it passport. So if you ever want, it's something they're not going to just train anybody and government entities on. It's something they're going to have their own contractor come out and take care of it. So 10 foot rule, 25 foot of high voltage lines. Uh, footing, um, just maintain, you got to maintain secure footing at all time. Be mindful where your feet are because remember that diagram I showed you a little while ago, how many people still hit their feet? <laughs> it happens. People's feet get rolled up on, chainsaws actually still hit their feet because you watch a lot of stance and I'm going to show you a stance here in a second, a picture, and we'll kind of talk about that or whatever. So, and operating chainsaws on a ladder it's there's quite a few people that still get injured and some people have actually lost their life from doing that still so trees and you ever watch youtube videos <laughs> my kids love that <laughs> watch us when you know somebody's doing it on a ladder that ladder's coming out from underneath of them and then they fall on the ground with a chainsaw and a lot of times when you fall what do you like to tend to do you like to grip when your hand's right on that throttle drop starting a chainsaw who's guilty yeah, if you don't know what you're doing, it's it's a big no-no. A lot of people, it's probably one of the hardest habits people need to try to break. It's not permitted, but you can actually, the only time you can actually drop start a chainsaw or permitted to is when you're in a bucket truck or if you're climbing a tree, you're a tree climber. They highly recommend you rope it up, but a lot of times you are permitted to do it with the small saws or whatever. But when you're on ground operations, you got to be down. You got to actually be, get started on the ground, not drop starting it so don't do that um there's, there's been a lot of stuff when we're chainsaw on you gotta think about this you got your muffs on you got you're focused on your cut you got maybe a wood chipper back there running um, other chainsaws or post saws some people it depends on if it's a big big job or not but be mindful don't walk up on somebody that's running a chainsaw because they they may jump back we've had some close calls and near misses here at Metro or whatever that we got wind of that people almost got cut by the operator because the person walked up on them. So try to get their attention from a distance. So let's walk up on them. Uh, this was a bad habit I was at using the tip of the, the chainsaw. A, a lot of people love using that tip part up there by the, you're putting a lot of pressure, a lot of strain on that front sprocket when you're using it. A lot of undercuts, a lot of limbing, a lot of people do that. But that's actually your greatest risk. That area of the chainsaw is for a kickback. So that front sprocket there. So try to avoid using that. Like I said, I know some of this stuff's hard habits to break for some of us, but let this all do the work. Um, by fences, metal objects, I've trimmed, I've been bucking before and you couldn't see the barbed wire wrapped around the tree because it's rusted and it was embedded into the tree. Next thing you know, you got the chainsaw bouncing back at you, right? That happens quite a bit, especially some people that have farms or fences down by the roadway and stuff. So you can look at it, be mindful. There's still maybe some stuff in there that makes you kick the saw back at you. Um, there was one time there was a gentleman, we were trimming a ditch line by UPS here in Louisville and by an old junkyard and UPS has bought the property. And there was a gentleman using the new Arbor style compound saw and I'm with loppers and pruners and stuff. And he just thought it'd be quicker. Well, he hit the chain link fence. <laughs> saw come back at him and actually hit him right here in the face. So... It actually messed him up pretty good. Brand new chain and everything and bad timing and wrong tool for the job, actually. So it's he paid a, a good price for it and had to have a couple surgeries and stuff. But it won't ever be the same. He'll never do that again, unfortunately. Um, so on this picture here, you got two little diagrams here at the bottom or whatever pictures here. Uh, you got one on the right, one on the left. Obviously, you want to see the one on the left, right? You want to see some like shavings. That means you got a good sharp chainsaw. Now, if you have the one on the right, that means your chainsaw is obviously dull. You need to sharpen your chain or replace your chain. So, but obviously, them dust particles create other other potential problems for your chainsaw, right? 
So when it actually starts to clog up the side there, then you got to, then now you go, okay, now I got another problem. And you're like, okay, now it's not getting bar oil, it's overheating. So, so if you see this picture here, look at the foot placement on here. This is a gentleman, Fred, a friend of mine. Um, see his feet, he keeps his feet back and away from the actual chainsaw. So when it goes through or whatever, it's got it propped up a little bit. Um, here in a second, I'm gonna go back to the video and I'm gonna show you the, how to carry in technique of the actual chainsaw here. Um, chain break, how you roll your wrist, the proper, safer way and that, probably the proper way I should say to do it. And carry, um, holding it with two hands, firm grip. So you got his thumb wrapped around the handle, got control of the saw, in case something does happen. So. And carrying technique, you got the uh, the bar to the rear. So if you did trip and fall, whether it's running or not, with no cover on there or not either, keep the car stuck to the rear. So if I tripped and fell, it won't hit me in the chest or the face. Chain break, I'm rolling my wrist. You roll your wrist, the proper way to set your chain break, instead of just throwing your hand forward, the handle does not turn. I've had some people try to turn the handle and don't turn. There you go. Go back to the PowerPoint here. So obviously, it's, like I said, a smoking saw, sign of a dull chain, or in the bar will maybe block from those particles. So make sure all this filled up properly. You may have to keep it clean, uh, proper cutting techniques. Let the saw do the work. Don't be one of them guys that are trying to run a chainsaw and run it like this. Let them teeter totter through it or whatever. Um, impact. I mean, you, you want to keep the saw below your shoulders and down because you can actually have the saw come back at your face or if it pushes a tree back at you, shoulder height and down. Um, don't stand on the downhill side of a, the log. Logs do roll. So even if you get down to the point where you've got most of your lemming off and you're trying to keep the tree balanced, it's dead, it can still roll on you, especially when they get down on the ground. I've had a story one of the guys told me when a supervisor one of the districts before actually had a log roll up on his leg and good thing he had a crew out there because his phone were in the truck and they had actually cut the log in front of him and behind him to get the log off his leg. And he got called out that night of it. And he goes, good thing I didn't try to cut this log out here by myself because two o'clock in the morning till someone drove by and finally found me with a log on my leg because he was on the downhill side of it and rolled up on him and he couldn't get it off. So um, engaged chain break, by, like I said, when the chain is out of rotation, I got in a good habit. Um, when that chain is out of rotating, the chain breaks set. So if I have to move from site to site or from the other side of the tree to one side of the other tree, my chain breaks set every time. So if I did trip and fall, I'm not going to have to worry about a chain rotating and hitting me. So it kind of eliminates that risk and that hazard there. So, And when you're not using a chainsaw, store it indoors and keep it locked up. Keep it out of reach of children. We got a last poll question coming up, Nicole. You ready for it? I am. I'm Everybody going to take the pledge for me? Pledge for chainsaw safety here. Everybody's taking the pledge. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I think all you all can attest no one to see anybody get hurt. Or if you ever see anything, someone doing something unsafe, correct them. I mean, because you may be having to one to apply first aid. And, and if it's a chainsaw injury, it's probably not going to be. It's probably going to have blood and stuff. And don't want people freaking out. So it's... Be mindful of all that. So once again, my name is Chris Gamblehorn. I work with uh, outside here with UK. I have a company called Safety and Equipment Training Institute. We do chainsaw training, bucket truck training, um, backhoe, excavator, skid steer. I'm very fortunate to go out with them and doing stuff throughout the state. And another thing, uh, keep in mind all the folks in Eastern Kentucky and in your hearts and stuff. They got they're going through a lot down there right now, and it's it's rough on them and. They're probably using chainsaws, heavy equipment and all that. And there's a lot of other stuff and it's hardship they're going through right now. So keep them in your thoughts and prayers. And if you have any questions or anything, uh, you can put them in the chat box or uh, hang tight a little bit after this is over here. But that's all I have for this uh, safety webinar for chainsaw. I'd like to hand it back over to our host, uh, Nicole.